Chapter 7, Chasing Kinseiko. Did you know the 2004 Upper Deck Signature Stars Jose Kinseiko baseball card actually depicts his twin brother, Ozzy Kinseiko? Topps duplicated the error on Jose's 2017 Topps Archives baseball card. Over the years, I've had dreams of meeting Kinseiko, not just at a card show, but on a more personal level. One such dream placed me as a fan at the 1989 World Series. I was standing near the third base line and a foul ball was hit my direction. It rolled to my feet and I picked up the game used 1989 World Series baseball to keep for my collection. If I recall correctly, Jose was playing left field in my dream and we exchanged a few words. Though the dream only lasted a few seconds, it felt real and stuck with me. A crazy idea. As I was returning from attending the TriStar Baseball Card Show in 2014, I had an idea and I just couldn't shake it. Could the countless Kinseiko Customs I poured my heart and soul into over the past year all get signed at a private signing? When I got home, I decided to reach out to his manager to see if a private signing was possible, and he promptly replied with pricing and terms. The price was much higher than I had hoped for, so I asked for a budget version to make it possible. We were able to agree on a price, so it looked like it was all going to work out. I just didn't know when. He mentioned that Jose would be in the Houston area within the next month or two, but that wasn't going to work for me as I wouldn't have everything ready for him to sign. Plus, I still had to get my head around the lunacy of having a private signing for me alone. Whenever you hear of someone doing a private signing, others will typically pay for autographs as well. If this is going to happen, I wanted it to be for me alone so that I could get all my custom signed for my collection. The next several months were full of uncertainty. Plan after plan fell through, and I began to lose hope that it would ever happen. When the signing started to sound hopeless, I made the decision to send the customs to a signing he was having up north. It would be a tragedy to make all these customs and not have him sign them. It would have been much better to personally show him my art pieces, but I didn't want to run the risk of holding out for something that may never happen. As a last ditch effort before shipping my customs to the signing he was having, I figured I'd check with his manager one last time to see if there was any chance of a private signing. He responded very quickly by saying, don't send the cards to the signing, wait until in person. I was literally in the process of packing them up to ship out when I heard this. When I received his email, I put the packing supplies away and kept my handiwork on my desk. Could this signing really still happen? During Jose's home run tour in 2014, it looked like he was going to visit Texas again, albeit a long ways away from us. The plan was to meet up with him there. His manager called me, the first and only time we spoke on the phone, by the way, though there are countless emails between us. Anyway, he told us the details of the event. He said Atticus and I could shag fly balls in the outfield during his home run tour. Yeah, I knew there were probably going to be tons of others doing the same thing, and I may not be able to say much to Jose, but that would be incredible. What a dream it would be to shag fly balls being hit by my childhood hero side by side with my son. I got really hyped up for this, and as the date drew closer, I grew a little anxious because I hadn't heard anything. About a week before we were about to leave, I emailed to ask for the details so we could wrap up our plans. He wrote and said the promoter canceled the event. I was really bummed out by this information. I had been dreaming of this for months. Just like that, I was a week away and yet again, my dreams were dashed. I reached out to his manager again to see when Jose would be in the area. Over the next several months, several things fell through over and over again. Planning a road trip. Holly mentioned to me, why don't we drive to him? She's a road tripaholic. His manager said that would work, and after about a month, we figured out the day. The whole thing was nerve-wracking due to our plans failing each and every time in the past. A week out, I nervously emailed to confirm, and his manager assured me that Saturday would still work. 
This was exciting news, but the problem is I didn't know specifically when or where we were going to be meeting him. I just knew that we were driving to Las Vegas to be there on Saturday. He said he would let me know the specifics later. I knew writing down everything would be important because I would probably be so starstruck it would be a challenge for me to remember my name, let alone what pen to use for what custom. I constructed an entire document to make sure I got everything right. I even planned on a number of bat pieces to get signed from the game used bat I cut up some of which I stained black so that he could sign in silver and gold marker for variety. I made a list of what inscriptions to write, the pen sizes to use, and more. I had every single little detail down on paper. I even built blank mock templates so that way he knew where to specifically sign on each item. This would prove to be very helpful so that I could make customs of them later. In addition to my custom pieces, I also brought along a small hoard of memorabilia such as jerseys, gloves, hats, cleats, and more. The time finally came for us to leave. As the start of our road trip began, I couldn't fathom that we were on our way to having Jose Canseco sign several things I had created. To say it was unnerving that we were driving across America without a specific time or place is an understatement. I had a hard time swallowing the fact that I was driving countless hours without any definite plans. Yes, that's right. We had no idea where we were going or what time. But when this opportunity pops up, you have to shoot for the stars and go for it. Still, there was a lot of doubt and concern. What if, when we get there, after 20 plus hours of driving, he cancels? What if I never hear from his manager again? What if Jose has to make a trip out of state for a more pressing obligation? More thoughts came to mind. What if Jose was in a bad mood and just signed everything and then walked off? What if he signed with his shades on and earbuds in? What if he was just a cold jerk and would not be willing to do any inscriptions I had requested? What if the private signing takes place in public and he spends the entire time talking and signing for others who came up to him? I had no reason to believe any of these things, but I always tend to end up painting the worst case scenario in my head. After driving for 20 plus hours, I had a lot of time to think about these things, not to mention the year leading up to this. As you can see, there were a billion things that could go wrong here. Would I be having a fire sale of my beloved Kinseiko collection if he was horribly rude to my family and me? What would happen then? How would that affect the rest of the trip? How would I feel about the incoming Kinseiko cards that would be waiting for me at home? Getting on the road. Day one meant 13 plus hours of driving to Albuquerque. And in the middle of this, we ended up getting caught in a massive hailstorm, the likes of which we had never seen before. As the hail came down and hit our car, it sounded like we were seconds away from having all of our windows shattered. It was incredibly scary and we prayed for protection. Thankfully, we got through it safely. Holly thought a tornado was coming because the rain and hail were going sideways. We made it to our hotel and I was still concerned as we were now nearly 900 miles away from home and there was no word of where, when, or how we were going to be meeting up with Jose. I emailed his manager and said that I would be booking a Las Vegas hotel in the morning and we'll send him the address so Jose can either meet us there or wherever he wanted. At this point, I really just wanted to hear something, anything from him. We went to bed and I woke up to an email from his manager. I will let you know where Jose wants to meet. Talk about a huge sigh of relief. I was still on his radar. At least I had heard something, so it sounded like we were still on. We got on the road and drove the last leg of the trip to Las Vegas, which was 570 miles away. Small victories continued to be proclaimed each time we crossed state lines and Atticus's illustrated map of the United States continued to be checked off with every passing different license plate. We checked off all of them but Rhode Island, by the way. 
Before we left, Holly organized an event for some other moms and their kids to put together things called blessing bags. These bags are filled with items to give out to homeless people on the side of the road. We were able to put them to good use on our trip. After a few more hours of mundane driving, Holly had taken the wheel for a while, I received an email from Jose's manager. Jose wants you to come to his house at 12 for the signing. Here's the address. I just started laughing. Holly asked me what I was laughing about, and I just read Jose Canseco's address out loud. No, that's not his address, is it? Yep, we're going to Canseco's house tomorrow. My favorite baseball player, the former best baseball player on the planet, just invited my family over to his house. That one email changed this whole trip from a mission to get autographs to a life experience that could far eclipse getting my custom signed. A true lottery winning feeling. I had spent this whole past year so focused on getting my custom signed and finished that I hadn't thought much about actually getting to hang out with him. During the rest of the drive, all of my previous concerns changed. What if he just met us in his garage with his shades on and earbuds in? What if he didn't say a single word to us, then barked at us to get off his lawn? Either way, going to his house, regardless of how cranky he may be or how rushed it might feel, was still beyond cool. Needless to say, I don't remember much about the drive after that. We made it to our hotel and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and stared at the oversized clock showing 5 o'clock in big red numbers. Seven hours until I was at his house. Surely my stomach would be in a thousand knots and I'll not be able to speak English, but in seven hours, ready or not, we will be there. About 10.30, an hour and a half before the signing, I got a text from his manager. Can you make it at 11 instead of 12? This really got me all knotted up. Was this an ultimatum? If I couldn't make it there by 11, would it not happen? We hadn't even checked out yet, and we were a half hour away. I texted him back saying that I thought I could make it by 11.30, and he wrote back, Okay, I'll tell him you're on your way, and we'll be there at 11.30. Please hurry. That one text turned my morning from one of fairly peaceful preparation to total chaos. We hastily packed up everything, checked out, got directions, and started driving. Was the get their ASAP text foreshadowing how hurried, rushed, cranky Jose may be? After only one wrong turn, we finally got there. We drove up to Jose's beautiful house. The garage door was closed, so that meant I was going to be ringing Jose Canseco's doorbell. Unreal. Going to my hero's house. We got out of the car, and the weather was perfect with sunny skies. I brought my huge tub of items to be signed, and after I rang the doorbell, I heard dogs barking inside. Jose Canseco's dogs. There was a massive elephant tusk art piece on the porch that made me wonder how he could just trust people for not stealing such an impressive piece that was sitting there. I looked back at Holly in bewilderment with an, I just rang Jose Canseco's doorbell look on my face while she was grinning from ear to ear. I felt like I had won the lottery just by being able to ring his doorbell. After a while, the door was opened by a young woman. It was Layla, Jose's girlfriend at the time. I had often thought about how this scenario would play out. I wondered how she, as a model, would act. A lot of times you might think of models as being rude, cold, self-absorbed, etc. I knew nothing about her, or even if she would be there, yet here she was opening the door to let us into their home. It was beyond surreal to see her in person. This very woman could be found in many pictures all across the web on my childhood hero's arm. As we walked inside, there he was, the incredible Cuban Hulk, the man I invited to my birthday party many years ago and didn't come. The guy who was the best player in baseball when I was growing up had just motioned for us to come over to his kitchen table. He had just finished laughing with Layla, telling her that after he mowed the lawn, a bird pooped on him. 
I resisted my urge to ask him to buy the shirt that the bird had pooped on to make a custom out of it. That would have been weird to do, right? Anyway, he cleared off some space on the table, and I lugged my huge toad onto it. I started by giving him a deck of cards I made for him. I know you like poker, so I made these for you. Here. I gave them to him, and as he shuffled through them, he said, Are you serious? Whoa, these are cool. Layla, come here. Take a look at these. Layla came over and looked through them, too. Wow, these are really cool. They came out very nice. Jose told me that he has friends come over every week or two to play poker, and they would be using the deck I made for him. Later on, I told him to look at the back of the playing cards. I made a custom back for each of them with my face and name in the design of a standard type of playing card. That way it was subtle and not too in your face. Ha! Tanner! I was thrilled that he said my name and would be using them with his friends to play poker. I'm very glad I made these for him because he was incredibly happy. As I got out some things for him to sign, the whole situation was very nerve-wracking. Thanks to the text I got earlier, I knew he was in a big hurry and I did not want to put my favorite baseball player in a position where he had to throw us out. Every piece I brought for him to sign had a note stating what type of pen to use and what to say. The first piece I had him sign was a triple thread style of card that was to be signed in silver. I gave him the wrong pen to use and the signature looked horrible. I asked if I could use his sink to see if I could quickly clear off the bad signature for my poor choice in pens. He said no problem and went to put on a baseball game for us to watch while we were doing the signing. All that time spent making the card and all the pressure to get done fast and here I was at Jose Canseco's sink, carefully yet feverishly rinsing off the card. It ended up coming off and I was able to put a better signature on it. One down, 164 more to go. After this, things went smoothly. Layla brought Holly and Atticus outside to the backyard so they could see their tortoises. I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised by Layla. Not that I had any reason to think otherwise, but I always seem to have a worst case scenario view of situations like this. She was so sweet to us all, offered us drinks and chatted with Holly the whole time. They hit it off very well and even fed the tortoises, which by the way, are awesome. Not just a signing. While I was excited about having Jose sign all of my custom pieces, that was only half the story. In the past several years, card companies have begun inserting pieces from jerseys that have been marked as player worn. These are jerseys that were worn by a player, but not necessarily in a baseball game. Jerseys from workout sessions, photo shoots, and more have been cut up to be used in cards. I figured if the card companies could do it, then so could I. This is the whole reason I brought along various jerseys, hats, gloves, cleats, and more. They were for Jose to wear, so I could have a virtually unlimited supply of player-worn material to make custom cards with for my collection. It took a lot of work tracking them all down, but I was able to secure a proper jersey and hat for every single team he was with. I even had some relevant All-Star and World Series patches sewn onto the jerseys. It would be fun to see my favorite player wearing jerseys for each team he was with for one last time and perhaps for the first time since he played with them. I first pulled out the fielding gloves. I brought three of them, one being a lefty because I had no idea if his finger was in good enough shape to wear due to the gun accident. The good news was that his finger looked great, so he put on a glove and started banging the middle of it with his fist. Man, this is a really good glove. He kept saying how much he liked it, and then the unthinkable happened. I might have to trade you one of my game use gloves that I use in baseball games nowadays for this. I almost jumped out of my skin when he said that. What baseball fan wouldn't want to make a trade like that with their favorite player? I told him I would love to trade, but if he wanted it, he could just have it. I quickly followed that up by saying I would love to trade. He mentioned it might be too small, so I prepared myself for the deal to not happen. 
Right at that moment, he hopped up and disappeared into his room. He came back with his glove and traded me, saying he knew he could make it work. To make things even better, he asked for a specific marker I had and laid down a perfect inscription in silver ink. It looked beautiful against the game used black leather. He said he used it to pitch with and play third base as well. I promised him this is one glove I would not be cutting up. He said, yeah, I do not cut this one up. Are you kidding, Jose? I am taking this with me to my grave. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. After this, Jose started to educate us all on how he breaks in gloves. He started by placing his new glove from me in the microwave and said he would probably work on the glove by pounding it, rolling it, and stretching it for about an hour to get it ready for his next game. As great as it was that he traded me gloves, it was also so awesome to hear that he planned on using my glove to play with in future games. Afterward, he put on the cleats I brought, but they did not fit well at all. While sitting in the chair, he started doing a funny tap dance with them partially on. We all got a kick out of it. He told me after his playing career, his feet had grown bigger. I called Atticus over, who was 12 at the time, and showed Jose his feet. Wow, you're going to be tall, Jose said. My son answered, that or I'm going to be a hobbit. Jose was right. At 16 years old, Atticus is now probably taller than him. He tried on all the hats while Holly and Layla were talking, so she wasn't taking any pictures at the time, but when it was time for the jerseys to be put on, Jose said we should go in the backyard for this so that we could take good pictures. He read my mind. Holly got several shots of him wearing each one. He was great and posed for each picture. I couldn't believe at 50 years old how grave shape he was in. He looked like he could still play at the major league level. The A's jersey was the last one he put on, and I was able to pose with him for a picture while wearing my A's jersey. After we were done, I was concerned about taking too much of their time, but he kept talking to us. He told us about all the neat animals that come into their backyard. When we went back inside, I had him sign each and every letter on all of the jerseys he tried on. I've always loved the nameplate letter cards, but they seem typically to be manufactured letters and not from actual jerseys that were worn. I loved when Tops came out with the own the name cards, but I think they would have been so much cooler if they were signed. Having him sign each letter was the best of both worlds for each team he played on. This was one of the most important parts for me of the entire trip. The agreement of 165 autographs I'd purchased in this deal was coming to a close. Though Jose wasn't keeping track of how many things he had signed, I didn't want to overstep the agreement I made with his manager, nor did I want to overstay my welcome. I told him that I did not pay for two of the jerseys to be signed on each of the letters, which meant 14 additional autographs. I said if he had the time to sign them, I would be happy to pay more. He could have easily just said he would gladly sign more and have me pay extra, but he didn't. He refused my money and signed the extras for free. Please, don't worry about that. I'll sign them all for you, no problem. Heck, you made a really awesome playing card deck for me. Some of the cards I had him sign caused him to ask questions. Like my request to have him inscribe Home Run number 500, May 9th, 2003. I told him this was for a card I called What If, and said that the date coincides with my birthday. He then understood and signed it while telling me if he had one more year in baseball, he would have gotten the 500. I wholeheartedly agree with him. The man was 37 years old the last time he played baseball and had so much athletic ability left in him. Another card he questioned was one that I made of him as a Simpsons character. Jose played a part in one of the most well-known Simpsons episodes ever, Homer at the Bat. In this episode, Jose Canseco, Don Mattingly, Daryl Strawberry, and tons of other players made guest appearances. The script called for Jose and Mrs. Krabappel to have a torrid love affair. Jose's wife, Esther, allegedly did not like this one bit and insisted it was pulled. This put the writers of The Simpsons in a scramble to come up with something else last minute. 
They instead had Jose go into a woman's house that was on fire to save various objects from the fire. As I gave him the card to sign, I asked him to personalize it to Mrs. Kerbopel. Mrs. Kerbopel? That's a strange name. I said, that's the name of the teach... And he interrupted me by finishing my sentence. Oh, 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 yeah, the teacher on The Simpsons. Okay. Step aside, Madonna. It looks like Mrs. Kerbopel had his affections back then. Having him sign all of the cards from my custom collection got quite messy. He was great, but I had all of my cards outside their holders so they could dry. They were all over his counters and kitchen table. Mismatched one-touch holders of various sizes were all over the place and would have been virtually impossible for me to put back together within a reasonable amount of time. I did the best I could by stacking everything up and carefully placing them in the tub I brought. During the signing, he mentioned something about showing us some home runs of his that he guaranteed were never seen by us before. Monster home runs that were hit further than his famous 1989 ALCS Sky Dome home run. This was something I was very much so looking forward to. It made me wonder, why hadn't he kicked us out already? The signing was done, and here he was still talking to us. He went to get a disc his father had made him that included interviews and home runs he had hit. It didn't work because he only had a Blu-ray player, so I suggested that I get the laptop from our car outside for it to play on, and he said okay. We popped in the disc and watched the whole thing together while he was narrating. Sure enough, some of the home runs he showed us were more incredible than I'd ever seen before. One part of the DVD that we watched was part of an interview with Jose wearing the game-used batting practice jersey I picked up a few months prior. The jersey had pills in his pocket, to which I still have, of course. Holly said to me, hey, isn't that the jersey you have? And Jose said, yep, that is the same one. Before we started watching, Layla had just made cupcakes for us. Jose and Layla offered us some when she took them out. When Jose Canseco offers you cupcakes, you do not say no. They were delicious. After watching the home runs, he talked to us about home run length, bat speed, size, and more. When he was finished, he had us come upstairs. He led us into his poker room where two beautiful poker tables were one of which had some incredible artwork done of him. He told me again how much he loved the playing cards I made him and then put them on the table for Holly to take a picture. He fanned them out and said, here's a better shot for you. We had a seat at his card table and he kept talking about the glove. Then we ended up playing cards. He asked me what I wanted to play and being someone who doesn't know much about cards, I was drawing a blank. Go fish? Memory? Old Maid? None of those sounded like good options, so I suggested Blackjack. We ended up playing several hands. Holly asked for another picture of us, and I was reminded about one pose I completely forgot about. The bash! How could I leave without a picture of us doing the bash? Apparently, I put my arm in the wrong place, so Jose repositioned it a few times. It was a rookie mistake on my behalf not having ever bashed with Canseco before. When we were done, we went downstairs for us to pack everything up and go. He insisted we take several of the cupcakes with us on our trip, which we agreed to do. I asked him to autograph one, but was kidding. Thankfully, he knew that because if he had signed one, I wouldn't have been able to bring myself to eat it. Well, okay, I would have absolutely eaten it. They were really good. The cupcakes he sent with us lasted a total of 30 minutes or so between Atticus and me. As we walked out the door, I thanked him for having us over, and we walked to our car to leave. We had one problem, though. Through all the amazing picture-taking Holly did, she left our keys and her phone on the poker table upstairs. Yikes! I rang the doorbell again, and Jose answered with Layla this time. I'm sorry, Holly left our keys and her phone upstairs. Oh, no problem, come in! I scurried up the stairs to retrieve them while they were still in the kitchen. I shook both their hands and thanked them once again for everything, then walked out the door. I am still in shock about how everything went. Everything I brought was signed and all memorabilia pieces were worn. 
We traded gloves, ate cupcakes they made for us, fed their animals, played cards, and watched his home runs while he narrated for us. I don't know how it could have been any better. It was an absolute dream come true. Scratch that. It was better than anything I could have dreamed. Just being there to hear him talk about how the bird pooped on him was fun. Later on, we got on the subject about what would happen if a robber broke into his house and how he may throw an apple as hard as he could at the guy. Yes, the guy who hit 40 home runs and stole 40 bases in a single season was telling us about how he would throw an apple at a robber. The entire signing and such probably would have taken 30 minutes, but he entertained us for a few hours. For me, the verdict is in. Both he and Layla are very hospitable, warm people, and went way above and beyond what my expectations were. Initially, getting my custom signed and having him wear everything was something I considered to be the pinnacle of my collecting career, quote unquote. Something that could never be topped. But in the end, the intangible experience of hanging out with him for the afternoon at his house far eclipsed that. As we drove off, I might as well have been floating. My car now had tons of player-worn and autographed game-used material that I could use to create tons of custom cards for my collection. It truly felt like I hit the lottery. In many ways, I felt like this was the ending to the book I always wanted to write. Somehow though, it just didn't seem like an appropriate ending to my collecting story. And I wasn't sure why. My story just felt incomplete. What else could top this? Writing about the experience. When my time with Jose happened, I was excited to share my experience with the online card collecting community. The night we got back to our hotel, I cracked open my laptop when Holly and Atticus were asleep. I started writing about all that had transpired while it was fresh on my mind. By the time we made it back home, my entire story about the experience was nearly ready to share. After putting the finishing touches on it, I posted my story on my website and all the major card collecting forums. Tens of thousands of people read about my experience and wrote congratulatory notes. It was suggested that I reach out to Beckett Magazine to see if they could do anything with it. Could it be possible that my story could be in my favorite magazine of all time? Getting to Beckett Online After a while, I reached out to Beckett and was told they would be interested in my story. They said they would run the article as a special online piece. I was thrilled. Little did I know that this was just the tip of the iceberg. Shortly after all of this had happened, I received a tweet from Chris Olds to check the Beckett website. Not knowing what to expect, I quickly typed in the address, and to my surprise, a large picture of Jose and me doing the bash was front and center on the website. I could not believe my eyes. Clicking the image of us took you to a huge article complete with pictures of the experience being published in Beckett Magazine. Shortly thereafter, I received word that my story would soon grace the pages of the actual print magazine itself. It has always been a dream of mine since I was a child to be featured in Beckett Magazine. I assumed this would be a black and white quarter page feature, but it turned out to be quite the opposite. When the August 2015 issue of Beckett Magazine hit shelves all across America, Someone who had a subscription reached out to me to show pictures of my feature. My story wasn't just a tiny quarter page black and white blurb. It was six full color pages showing off pictures of Jose and me hanging out, along with several of the custom pieces I had made. It was the largest article in the entire magazine. Not only that, but they even put us on the cover of the magazine itself. Pictures from all over the United States were sent to me by other collectors. It was crazy to see a picture of Jose and me doing the bash on the cover of a national magazine sitting next to magazines with celebrities and models. When I finally received my copy of the magazine, it was such an incredible feeling. When I finished reading the article, I had a what-if feeling about Canseco's most notable card, his Rated Rookie. What if there's movement on it in the price guide? If you're a child of the 80s or 90s, you know what I'm talking about. 
you would live and die by the arrows next to cards in the Beckett price guide. With this being the first current Beckett I held in my hands for quite some time, I just had to take a peek. What I found was truly thrilling to see. His rated rookie card did, in fact, have an up arrow next to it. In fact, out of the thousands of cards listed from 1948 to the early 90s, it was one of only three cards in the entire price guide that had shown a bump in price. I asked someone who worked at Beckett if my experience could have caused this, and he said it was entirely possible. I was thrilled to hear that I may have caused a bump in price for a card that was once one of the most coveted baseball cards in the world. My Baseball Card Appearance Another one of my dreams was to be on a baseball card. Shortly after all of this happened, Beckett announced on their website that they would be producing a sports card set of 15 cards exclusively available at the National Sports Card Convention. These serial numbered cards would depict trading card size Beckett monthly covers featuring various back issues. Various booths at the National would have these cards available. If you're one of the first 200 to go from booth to booth to collect all 15 cards and present them at the Beckett booth with proper documentation, you would receive a special autographed card produced by Beckett. Someone sent me a visual checklist and to my surprise, one of the cards in the 15 card set was my cover with Canseco and me doing the bash. This meant the world to me. Since Canseco was on the same card, it also meant that my card would likely be in the collections of other Canseco collectors as well. I count all of this as the wildest blessing that could have ever happened to me in this hobby. Did hanging out with Jose at his house really happen? I'd pinch myself and look at the custom card he inscribed and signed for me. Tanner, this is awesome work. Your friend, Jose Canseco. We've communicated a few times since I was at his house, starting with him messaging me later on in the year after we hung out just to check in to see how me and my family were doing. Since then, he's requested some custom cards of mine which I happily made and sent him. It all still seems like a fairy tale to me, but as I quickly learned, my journey in this hobby was far from over. This gets a little bit bigger, and this gets a little bit bigger for softball. Interesting. You know, for softball. If this was for baseball, I wouldn't need to do it, but for softball, so I need the pocket. Since the ball's a lot bigger, I need the pocket a little bit bigger. So where, where do you play softball? Did I do that? Um, God, I, I play league nights. I play charity tournaments. I just played one in a... In Canada last week. Oh, did you for a really? charity for abuse kids. <laughs> so we played four tournaments. I play a lot of tournaments, 40 and over, 50 and over. Um, I do home on competitions. So. Yeah, I, I wish I could have seen you at the, at the old the tour deal that you were doing last year. Yeah, that's, so I do a lot of that. Oh, I still have to hit. Yeah. Ah, all right. All right. All right. All right. 